But we need to make sure as veterinarians, we don't tie our entire identity to being beloved, the beloved veterinarian, that we do what we do because it's important to us to nurture that bond. Have you ever felt scared, frustrated, and just needed support? We all have. Getting into veterinary medicine, we have these feelings, especially as we are younger professionals. But even as we get older, we will need to learn new things or things will happen in life where the support of others helps us find the courage we need. This episode today with Dr. Elaine Clemenson is a story of courage. It's a story of two veterinarians who went from newlyweds and newly vets to practice owners and then careers they never would have expected. Elaine founded Evolve Leadership Coaching and Consulting, where she's helping leaders connect with their values, define their purpose, and transform their veterinary hospital culture. Elaine talks frequently of the unique supportive partnership with her husband and how they discovered the most important things in life, which have helped them thrive in all aspects. Elaine is very insightful and offers wisdom no matter where you are in your career or life. Now on to the conversation. Thank you said that you may be an early identifier. So when did you know that oh. you- wanted to get into veterinary medicine. I've never heard that term early no? identifier. Oh, Marcy Kirk. I think I heard it from her first. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, well, okay. I, I my name is Elaine Clemenson. I'm an early identifier. As a veterinarian. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so yes, I, I always felt a real connection to the animal world. I grew up on a family farm. And uh, from a very early age, I loved animals. I was a second child. I was supposed to be the son that would take over the farm. And I ended up being not only not a son, but a very sensitive, emotionally sensitive, girly girl. I didn't Mm -hmm. like to get manure on my shoes. My dad didn't quite know what to do with me, but I loved animals. And my father literally fainted at the sight of blood. Back in the day, you used to have to get a blood test when you got married, apparently. My parents had to go for some kind of blood test when they before they got married. And the family story is that my dad told the doctor, I'm going to pass out. And he's this big burly farm guy. And they got his blood sample and he passed out. So when the vet would come to the farm, my sis, elder sister was better with farm equipment and mechanical stuff. I was good with the animals. So I became the person that would help the vet. And I remember the first time I saw a veterinarian trocarize a bloated steer in our family feedlot and release all the gas. I was like, that is so cool. I want to know how to do that. (laughs) (laughs) But I did go through a period, uh, you know, the classic story of getting into high school and being told I wasn't smart enough, that maybe I should have a plan B. And I was, I was incredibly stubborn. You know, all our strengths, our strength and also can be our Achilles heel. I'm incredibly tenacious and I, that's it. I'm going to prove to you, I can get into that school. <laughs> but there was a period where I did seriously think about going into fine arts. Oh. Very different career paths. Yeah. Coming from a sort of conservative prairie farm family the idea of telling my father and my mother that I was going to be an artist, not a veterinarian. I just knew it wasn't going to fly. And it was a good, it was a good choice, quite honestly. (laughs) Off to vet school I went. Yeah. And you met your husband in vet school. Is that right? I did. I did. So I had a, a boyfriend when I entered vet school, I went to the university of Alberta and in Edmonton. Alberta, Canada. And then in Canada at the time, we had five veterinary schools. The new Atlantic Vet College had just opened the year I applied, but you're pretty much regionally limited based on your residency. And so Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, the Western College of Veterinary Medicine is where I went. And I think other veterinarians have had the experience of you get grouped in vet school alphabetically. So my maiden name was Leishner a good German name. My husband was Clemenson. 
So we were in the same lab groups and lab partners, and he was my buddy. We were we were friends. And it wasn't until my second year of vet school, Rob, my husband, had gone to the Queen Charlotte Islands to Haida Gwaii, is what I should be calling it. Haida Gwaii is a group of islands north of Vancouver Island, off the coast of British Columbia, sort of between Vancouver Island and the Alaska Panhandle. It's an amazing part of Canada. And so he had gone out there to work on a ranch and in a veterinary clinic. The father was a purebred Hereford breeder. The son was a veterinarian. And he spent four months out there as a farmhand and working in the veterinary clinic, came back to vet school and said, Elaine, you have got to go to Haida Gwaii next summer. You're going to love it. They're awesome people. You should go. And so the year went by. We're still just friends. I decided, yeah, I'm going to apply for that job. And I got it. And I, my dad didn't want me to go to Haida Gwaii. He wanted me to come home to the family farm. My boyfriend in Saskatchewan didn't want me to go all the way out there for the summer, but I went. And through that summer, the, the veterinarian's wife kept saying, why, why are you with this other guy? Because he'd come out to visit me. So the family I was living with had met my boyfriend, weirdly enough, also named Robert, Rob, met Rob number one and said, you need to ditch him. You and him, mm -mm, mm -mm. you need to go out with Clem. Everyone called my husband Clem for Clemenson. You and Clem. And I'm like, oh, he's just my drinking buddy. <laughs> He's not, he's not a boyfriend. But you know what? As the summer went by, sometimes you need to give yourself the space to really think and see things from a new perspective. And I realized he was a great guy, my current boyfriend, but he wasn't the one I wanted to spend my life with. So I broke up with him, went back to vet school, ended up six months later dating my current husband. That's how we got together. And Aww. it just felt... You know, because we were friends first, and I think because I really, I really admired and respected and liked him. It's kind of cool when it works out as friends and then grows into something more. So you were talking also about this uh, job that you applied for, and it was, it sounded like it was maybe a mixed practice as well. So is that something that you were thinking about going into long term? Yeah, well, for sure. You know, growing up on a farm, both of us came from prairie farms, my husband and I. What we knew of veterinary medicine was rural mixed animal practice. Mm -hmm. And I had loved the James Harriet stories. In fact, one of my, my quote in my vet school yearbook book was a quote from James Harriet. And the story... The narrative I had painted for myself is I was going to be a rural mixed animal veterinarian, the female version of James Harriet, part of a small community, taking care of all creatures, great and small. And my husband was into that journey, too. He went to vet school a different route. He uh, got out of high school. He came from a farming family where there wasn't as much of a push towards higher education. He was one of eight siblings. Mm -hmm. a very poor farming family in Southern Alberta. And his parents were amazing people, but a little bit more of a belief, like just be happy where you're at. Don't, don't strive for more. So he worked in roof trust factories, farm labor. He would get laid off in the winters. And then at a certain point, you know, be living in his parents' basement again in his early twenties, he realized I've got to do something with my life. What do I like? I love being outside. I love animals. So he was a late. So what did you say? I was an early identifier. identifier. He was a late identifier. <laughs> and for him, it was a more intentional decision based on they didn't have livestock on their farm. It was a grain farm. Mm. So he didn't have the experience working with veterinarians as a child like I did or seeing what a veterinarian did. It was more, hmm, I like these things. So I'm going to go into veterinary medicine. And then it was a natural transition from that background to go into mixed practice. So we started in a practice in central Alberta with a solo doctor who hired this young couple just out of vet school. We got married right after vet school and hoping we'd take over the practice. It was one of the traditional uh, early vet experiences where you showed up on day one, he showed you the ropes. Day two, he 
gone for a week and we're going, oh my gosh, I was doing a C-section the second day in practice, a C-section on a dairy cow oh. on an emphysematous fetus. Oh my. Yeah. With, with me and my super green husband. And of course the cow died and the farmer complained. And my boss said, well, we're just going to buy the pay for the cow. My, my young vet screwed up. So I think that first year was super instrumental in Rob and I learning how to work together because we needed to be each other's support. If we were at odds with each other, we weren't going to make it. It was a crazy year. Holy smokes, it was a crazy year. And as much as that uh, early mentor was not a mentor, he was one of these guys who had a heart of gold. He was such a good man, but he was just this big, blustery if you asked him, hey, this is the first time I've had to do an um, umbilical resection on a calf, like, give me some tips. What do you do? And he'd say, oh, you always do A, B, C. And then when things didn't go well, he had this hilarious voice. He'd come back and say, so what'd you do, Elaine? Well, I did A, B, and C. Oh, you never do A, B, and C. You do C, D, and E. It's like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back, we laughed a lot about him, but, you know, it was the days of being on call 24 seven, no mentorship, two young vets, and we learned so much. And that community was so amazing. So amazing to us. Yeah, I had I had farmers that I was in tears, I didn't know what to do. The cow is down, the calf is stuck, it's still alive, its heads hanging out the back end, but the rest of it's still in the uterus, we can't budge it. I don't know what to do. And I just started sobbing and came over to me, put his arm around me and said, you know what? It's okay. We're going to get through this together. <sighs> just the reframing I needed to keep going. So super challenging, but super informative as who we came, became as vets. And then we, we moved, we decided we need, we need more mentors. We need some mentorship. So we, after a year, went to a larger rural mixed animal practice with um, three other veterinarians. So a team of five veterinarians, bigger support team. And we were there for five or six years. I always forget how long. We were there for a few years as associate vets. And then we bought in as partners in that practice. And that's a whole story in itself. I don't know if you want to go into. <laughs> Is this the one where the town knew the veterinarian really well and they kept talking about him. Oh, that was the practice we bought. No, I know the story now you're talking about. I'm a bit of a storyteller. So after after a failed partnership, we we left. I was three months pregnant with our first child and we did a locum position for six months in British Columbia. Kind of licked our wounds, very quickly figured out what was next because we had a baby on the way. And we bought a practice in a small community, a companion animal practice. Mm -hmm. It's the saying, Megan, a necessity is the mother of invention. We needed to reinvent ourselves. We needed something because we're starting this family. So we bought this solo doctor practice in, in a sort of rural area of British Columbia, the West Kootenays. And I think the story you're talking about is how beloved the veterinarian practice was that we bought. I think about crucible moments. Have you ever heard crucible moments in your life? I don't think so. Crucible moments. Hmm. Those moments that really had a big impact on your mindset, changed your trajectory maybe. That story I shared was a crucible moment for me and the way I thought about my identity as a veterinarian and how how I wanted to be and what mattered. So when we bought this practice, it was a very economically depressed part of British Columbia. And the British Columbia Veterinary Association had just done a, the very first economic survey, looking at the economic state of veterinary practice in British Columbia. What was the current fees people were charging, what they had a big consultant come in, what do veterinarians need to charge for a two view x-ray in order to pay for their overhead, pay their staff, value their education and expertise. 
So they'd done this big survey and we ended up buying a practice that was in the most economically depressed part of British Columbia. And the practice itself had the lowest fees in that area. So I think I can pretty safely say we bought the cheapest fee schedule of the practice in British Columbia and had this vision to shift it from, well, your dog is old, you know, maybe you should just think about putting him down. It's probably not worth doing a blood panel or an x-ray or diagnosing him. Let's just make him comfortable and we'll put him down when his time comes. I'm being not every veterinarian in the area practice that way, but that was still, still sort of the way. This was 32 years ago or thir- maybe 30 years ago, Megan. And we had this vision of like, there's people who want more. There's people who want access to higher standard of care, in-house diagnostics. We're going to, we're going to take this practice to a different level. But you can imagine how hard that was when the whole area and all the veterinary clinics in it have a very different mindset. So in those first six months, all we heard was about how everyone loved Dr. Peter, the veterinarian whose practice we bought. He um, had been the first vet in the area. He initially did mixed animal, and then a lot of the farm work died in our, our area for different reasons. He just did companion animal, but people loved him. He was open six days a week. He ran a boarding kennel. He was there seven days a week. He gave his life to that practice. He was in his 70s when we bought it. So very much a beloved veterinarian who's been in the community for more than 30 years. And these two young upstarts take over his practice. And it was hard to just hear how much people loved him. And then it was interesting to see in six months what transpired. Suddenly they stopped talking about him. And they either bonded to us and loved us, or they moved on. And for me, that crucible, the crucible moment in all of it was learning how his marriage broke up shortly after he sold the practice. He had one, he had two children, one who'd passed away and one child who was still alive and lived across the country. And I don't know, I can't speak for him, but to me, it was like you gave your whole life to this practice and you were beloved. And in six months, they forgot you. And I thought, well, that's the way it should be. This is a job. This is what we do. But we need to make sure as veterinarians, we don't tie our entire identity to being beloved, the beloved veterinarian, that we do what we do because it's important to us to nurture that bond, to take good care of our patients. There's pride and joy in doing a job well, but there's more to life than just being a veterinarian. So you mentioned that this was a a crucible moment for you. When this hit you, did you do something differently? Like what, what happened after that? You know, it wasn't, I have to be honest, Megan, and say it wasn't like when everything shifted. Mm-hmm. It's, it's always a little bit of a journey. Like you get these messages, you think about it. You, we're so busy. We had a brand new baby. We had a new team to train, a new building to renovate. There was so much going on, but it, it kind of probably sat there. And I thought about it for years and other little messages came about five years in, we decided we're open six days a week. We run a boarding kennel. It's just my husband and I We're on call 24 seven, unless we hire a locum, which was really hard to find in our rural area. We're, we're on call every single night, the two of us with young kids. Other messages came when we decided, okay, we're going to stop boarding animals. And then we decided we're gonna, none of the other vets in the area are open on Saturdays. We're going to stop being open on Saturdays. We've got now two young kids. And it all kind of built on itself to realize when we stopped boarding animals, it was just such a relief. And we realized, you know, people weren't upset. We were always so worried what clients would think. People are going to be upset. We're going to lose business because of it. Our business actually grew because we had more time and energy to put into the veterinary side of things, which is what we should have been focusing on. Mm. When we closed Saturdays, same thing happened. We actually grew. We were still available for our clients after hours if they needed us on a Saturday. And the only people that complained were the retired client who could come in every day of the week, any other time, 
And the stay-at-home mom, one of our clients who was a stay-at-home mother was really upset and transferred her files to another clinic. So that was the big crucible moment that I look back on. But all those other little moments just reminded me that at the end of the day, whether people love you or hate you doesn't matter. It's how you feel when you look in the mirror. Did I do a good job? Did I show up with integrity? Did I do what I said I was going to do? Did I follow up with my patients? Did I give this patient the best care based on that family's needs and incomes and values that I could? Yes, I can look in the mirror and feel good about myself. That's more important than having external validation from clients. And I think my husband was also very good at saying, because I am such an achiever, saying, what's going to matter at the end of the day? Is it that you have a relationship with your kids? Is it that we're still married? Is it that you've got friendships and people in this community who love you for Elaine, not Elaine the vet? Ooh, that's powerful. To me, just listening to the story, it almost has this freeing feeling. Like at first you might, it might be a little depressing, right? But then just hearing you talk about it, it it's actually freeing. So you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth. How did you feel when that kind of all clicked? Oh, I feel like it's part of creating healthy boundaries. Again, mm-hmm. For sure. It felt empower. I would, the word I'd use is empowering. And it was really cool to be a practice owner and a leader. And it kind of, tra- it kind of, the whole journey um, was parallel to my journey in practice ownership, in management into transitioning to actually being a leader. And as our practice grew from a mom and pop, one doctor practice to four veterinarians and a support team, it was for me really powerful to to help my young paraprofessionals, the RVTs, my associate vets that worked with me, start to learn the importance of do it for you, don't do it for them. And it doesn't mean... It doesn't mean you're not caring. You're caring deeply about your patients. You're building relationships that are super rewarding. You're part of this amazing bond, this human-animal bond. Like, what an awesome, cool job. And it's a job. It's okay to create healthy boundaries. And helping them learn that, you know, sometimes when the client calls and they push past your reception team so they can talk to the doctor, it feels really good. Oh, they want to talk to me. It feels really good to be the only one who can fix the problem. It gives our ego this little hit. But you're also your own worst enemy because now the next time that client calls, they're going to push through to talk to you. Oh, I just wanted to, I just wanted to book an appointment, Dr. Megan. Oh, okay, let me do that for you. And so teaching people the importance of honoring yourself. And having autonomy and control over what you say yes and no to and empowering our team to utilize our support staff and say, oh, you wanted to book an appointment? Great to talk to you, Mrs. Smith. I'm going to put you back to Jennifer because she is so much smarter at our scheduling system than I am. Next time you call, just ask for Jennifer. And I think we're our own worst enemy in thinking that in wanting to be liked so badly, that we can't create those boundaries. And then it's just one of many things that we put on our shoulders that leads to that burnout. Because we've talked previously and you've been very generous with sharing some of your story. There was a point where like all of these are very healthy things that we need to implement, but there was a point where it sounded like you got to where it just was not enjoyable anymore. So do you mind sharing a little bit about that path there and, and kind of what happened? <laughs> so you're so awesome, Megan. <laughs> I'm <laughs> laughing because as, as I was saying that, I'm like, oh yeah, Elaine, you sound so like, oh, look at you, such a leader, teach your team about boundaries and autonomy of self and self-care. Yeah, I was really good at taking care of people. 
Oh, that's super good at that. This this makes me think of a, a coach, a Canadian coach called Michael Bungay Stanier and his model of the advice monster, which maybe we'll get into. But to answer your question, yeah, I I took my own advice and yet I was my own worst enemy when it came to my team. Like I would sacrifice myself to take care of my partner, my husband, my kids, and my veterinary team at work, my client care specialists, my technicians, my support team. I don't know. Maybe some of them would say, no, she didn't. But I, I, I cared so much about their well-being that I took on a lot of things myself that I had trouble delegating. So I think some of it was situation that we started as this mom and pop shop. And my husband and I did everything from management to leadership, to taxes, to building maintenance, to hiring, firing, training, mentoring. And over time, those were skills I really enjoyed. And I was kind of had some natural aptitude for. So I was the so-called leader where I led the morning rounds. I led the staff meetings monthly. We closed for a morning every month and did staff meetings. As our team grew, we took 15 to 30 minutes every morning and did morning rounds to get us all on the same page before we started the day. So I was doing the leadership and I was doing the management. Um, You know, I had really key people who were helping with that. But if we had a back order, everything came to Elaine. If there was a client conflict and my staff couldn't work through it with the client, I was the one that talked the clients off the edge and and sorted through that. I did our freaking social media. I don't know. Now I look back and think, how did I possibly do it? I coached team members on con- interpersonal conflict with another team member. I checked in with people. I My door was always open. I remember my associate vet who ended up buying the practice when we took time off to go volunteering, my husband and I, and she, we said, this is your chance to try on re- leadership and see see what you think, see what you think about, you know, being the one. She said, I can't believe how you get anything done. Like, when do you do your charts, Elaine? Like, people are just like, you can't finish a thought. People are coming in and asking about this. And what should I, I thought I wasn't a micromanager, but I was. I was trying to turn it all over, but I needed a, I needed a hospital manager and just manage and lead the team. Or I needed to get out because I was done. And I think it was hard for me to say I was burnt out. Um, I've just signed on and am a mentor with MentorVet, Mm -hmm. Addie Reinhardt and the team. So I just finished my training and learning more about compassion, fatigue, and burnout. I had signs, I had both signs of both of those at the end. I wrote an article on it that described it like every day I'd get up and feel like I walked to the river and I had to swim across this raging river and just dive in. And if I could just get to the other side at the end of the day, that was a win. It just felt like a struggle. And so not sure if I'm answering your question. I think now looking back, there was a lot of pride tied up in being this person who could not only juggle a whole bunch of balls, but keep them all in the air. One of those balls was taking care of everybody else. And you can only juggle 50 balls for so long before you start to not just drop all the balls, but they all just come crashing down. And again, power of reflection. It was it was on a trip to Africa. We got some money from my dad. And our kids, our two amazing kids were at a stage. One was on a rotary exchange in Brazil. One had just started university. And we traveled a lot with our kids around the world. That My husband and I said, oh, we could go to Africa. We could do the irresponsible thing and go on safari. We've always wanted to go to Africa. And it was really just taking three weeks and leaving the country and being in this totally different environment, slowing down my crazy monkey mind and knowing it does, I can't do anything. Whatever happens back at the practice is going to happen. I'm going to trust my locum because I, from Africa, I don't even have access to the internet or a cell phone. I can't do anything. That I had this space to really think about it and maybe another crucible moment. On that trip, I remember 
uh, my husband's earbuds had broken and we were sharing one set of earbuds, listening to a song by Noah and the Whale, an indie band. And there's a verse at the end of your life, when you're looking back, I want to look back on my life and say, what a great ride. What a freaking amazing ride I've had. And it was just like this moment of going, I need to change. I can't keep doing this. I don't, and not so much I can't, I don't want to. I'm now, you know, 48. I'm over halfway through my life. And there's a lot of stuff I still want to do. Something's got to give here if I want to do those things. It took a few, it took a bit of time, as I recall, once we got back from that trip, to kind of sit with that thought and figure out what I was going to do about it before I even talked to my husband. And then it came out in a conversation where we were trying to figure out, the universe often throws you a lot of signs. And I was really bad at listening to them and just putting on my blinders and just plowing ahead. And the other sign was this solo doctor who was our colleague in our community. He had his own practice. For years, I had gotten the impression he was done. He was ready to retire. But he was waiting for his wife to hit 65, get the pension, and then they were both going to retire together. And suddenly he got multiple myeloma. And in three months, meant, went from being a golfing fanatic, fit, healthy, 60-year-old man to gone in three months. So there was that. There was this trip to Africa where I realized you know what, like, what am I going to do with the third, third of my life? Is this just nose to the grindstone, juggling all the balls, never having time for the other things that I love doing? Is that what I want? And so finally, you know, I said, I, something's got to give. I can't work full time, lead this growing team, which this practice that's booming now because our solo doctor practice is closed. So all his clients are coming to us. And my husband said, okay, Elaine, we need 10 more years and we financially solid and we can retire. 10 more years. And he looked at me, he could see my eyes and he goes, well, five, five more years. And I just burst into tears and said, I don't think I can do five more days. Some days I don't think I can do five more days. And, you know, this is the value of having an amazing relationship with your partner. We had just finished paying off all this massive debt from student loans to buying a practice to building a brand new state-of-the-art facility, which we built while our kids were young, paying off that debt, that million dollar loan. We're finally, finally at this point where we could, in the next five years, sock some serious money away. And he just looked at me and said, okay, let's call a practice evaluator. Let's sell it. And it was like this weight lifted. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Let's do it. And the fact that he did it with you too. He did it with me. And you know, for him, I think veterinary medicine wasn't a passion like it was for me. It was more of a job, which was nice to have a partner with that different mindset because he'd help me keep it in check that I didn't completely lose myself in this thing that I'd always wanted to be. And it was really scary. It was really scary not knowing what was next. Again, we had a lot of conversations about that. Like for him, financial, we were giving up some really solid financial security. Like what now? Do we have enough? Will we have enough? What next? But I guess that's been the other theme in my journey has been being willing to step into fear and trust that something good's going to be on the other side of that fear. If you just Go through those uncomfortable feelings and believe in yourself. As I said, you know, just believing in yourself and stepping into your fear, I feel like there's a big part of your journey that has been the same. And I'm curious about, you know, the podcast mm -hmm. and stepping into this different role versus traditional. Like, I was always in traditional veterinary practice, private practice. What has helped you find your courage? And face your fears, Megan. I think there was an element of the excitement of the unknown. Like, I think I am a type of person where that is actually a little exciting to feel like you are doing something a little unique. 
to be the young girl who flew by herself to Zambia or <laughs> leave her family behind uh, when she was in junior high to go to Australia. I think there there is this curiosity and adventurous spirit. Now, some of that I have had to kind of learn along the way. I think very similar to your own story, having a good support system has been crucial to feeling confident enough to take that step into the unknown, to the scary. And there is something that is stronger than the fear. And that is this desire to do something bigger than myself, to challenge myself, to see what I can do with the life I have been given, all of those pieces. And I'm sure I'm missing some that helps tremendously when embracing into the unknown or doing something different. I really like that. I really like that. And I think you hit on some things that resonate with me and maybe, maybe why I, I felt really connected to you, Megan, even though there's you know, we're different generations, we've had different journeys in vet medicine, is that sense of adventure. Mm. That sense of curiosity (laughs) about the world. You know, I grew up in this really sheltered farming community where I remember the first big trip my husband and I did was on motorcycles and we rode down the coast to the tip of Baja and camped and rode through the U.S. And my family was really scared about us going into Mexico on motorcycles. But there's something about that adventurous spirit, that um, quest to see beyond the next horizon and just that curiosity. And I love, I love that. And I was thinking as you spoke that I think once you do it once, it it gives you this sense of confidence and empowers you. And I, I, I think the biggest gift (laughs) now as a mom, the biggest curse I've given my children or biggest gift I've given my children is the gift of seeing the world. Cause we, I loved to travel. I got that bug of adventure and experiencing other the way other people live it doesn't have to be this big adventure it starts small for people when you're trying to figure out how do I get to that point where I'm a little bit more confident I think Mm -hmm. even as adults or in our work what's one thing that scares us slightly just as in that little bit outside of that comfort zone, something that is a little not normal for us. And each time you do that, I think it starts to build that confidence. It it makes it a little less scary. And so your comfort bubble starts to expand and expand. I really, what I, I really love that. And I love that idea of, and then I think to add to that is, and you learn to sit in that uncomfortable feeling how are you going to celebrate that you did that and mm-hmm. create a bit of space to think about what were the lessons that came out of that? Because that's and then where really it becomes easier the next time. Yeah. I really like that. We will definitely have to come back and, and have more conversations. I do want to acknowledge you are an amazing coach. And even in just the few conversations that you and I have had so far, you have been a wonderful listener. You have given great, great wisdom. And so as you are constantly learning more in how to to coach and, you know, we bonded very much that we just have huge hearts specifically for the veterinary profession. and, And that's what this podcast is dedicated to, what is, I know you have many, but what's one thing that maybe it's been on your mind most recently that you would like to share with the veterinary profession? That's a great question. There's so many pieces to the puzzle of what's happening with our workforce shortages, our struggles with mental health, high rates of suicide in the profession, corporatization of the profession. People have opinions on that and and culture. And I think it's a challenge right now, Megan, because like on one hand, there's conversations happening that are so important that 
I've been in veterinary medicine 1991, so 32 years. That weren't when I graduated from vet school, we didn't have those conversations. We didn't talk about suicide. We didn't talk about mental health. We didn't talk about leadership. We didn't talk about culture. We didn't talk about authenticity, showing up as your authentic self, creative, safe, brave spaces for our teams. Those conversations were not happening. And it is so good that they're happening. We need to take off the blinders and look honestly at what's happening in our profession, in our own practices, and see the problems and not ignore them and learn to sit in that discomfort of the really sucky stuff. I have coached colleagues who have had, who have had a member of their team die by suicide. That is so heavy. You can't walk away and ignore that. And yet, we have to find the joy and the hope and decide what is the future we want for this profession? And it's finding that balance of saying we become the stories we tell ourselves. And I think the real challenge right now in veterinary medicine is that there's this really heavy, dark narrative workforce shortages, burnout, compassion fatigue, suicide, young, amazing, talented people leaving this profession I love far too early because they don't have the leadership support. They don't have the cultures that they need to thrive and bring their whole selves to work. And that, you can hear it in my voice probably, that really, like, oh, it makes me sad. It makes me angry that our leaders aren't doing better to care for their people. And it makes me fired up to make a difference so that we can change that. So how do we create this powerful vision of what we want for veterinary medicine? What is great about veterinary medicine? What is the story we want to tell ourselves over and over and over again so that, and neuroscience supports this, so that we become that story and still have room to take care of this other side of it. Does that make sense? It does. it does. And I don't I don't have the solutions to that, but I think what you're doing is one we've talked about the dropping the stone in a pond. How do we drop a bigger stone and create bigger ripples? But sharing our stories is huge and and leaving space for people to interpret your story however to take whatever lessons they need from it and moving away from telling to there's more than one thing you can get out of this. What are you going to do with this? Mm. And kind of embracing all those shades of gray that this profession can be whatever you want it to be. And how can we make sure that we don't get stuck in our need to have all the answers? This is the mm. other, I think this is the other really big challenge in veterinary medicine. We're not unique in this. Other other professions and industries are challenged too with feeling like, Leaders need to have the answers. Leadership is about strategy, executing strategy, having all the answers, showing no weakness, always knowing what to do. And I think there is so much power in my own journey. I discovered this in admitting you don't have the answers and asking for help. And maybe it's asking for help outside of our profession, even asking mm -hmm. for help from your team. That was one of my five years before we sold the practice. I was just struggling with this growth in our practice. And we cannot meet the needs of our communities if all we can do is three surgeries and a dental in the morning. We've got to up our efficiency. And, you know, my solution as a leader was to tell people what they needed to do. Have big strategy meetings. Here's how we're going to do this. Here's how we're going to leverage time. Here's how the schedule. Here's what this tech is doing while this tech is doing this. And, you know, Elaine's telling everybody what to do. And it was like a wall went up that people were just, put, they weren't in my face pushing back. They were pushing back by just not doing it and slowing down. And I stepped back, I was out for a ski one day and I was just so like, why, why, why? It's so simple. Why can't they follow what Elaine has laid out? The strategy is there. We should be able to get this amount done and we can meet all the need and we can all have our lunch break and we can all be home at five if they would just do what I am telling them to do. I know best. And it was like this light bulb went off and it was as I was probably at such a state of frustration and because I gave myself 
a couple hours to get out of my skis in nature, which is my place where suddenly I think creatively. And a light bulb went off and I'm like, oh my gosh, you have a team of younger people. I'm going to use, I don't like grouping people by generation, but millennials who aren't like your boomers and Xers that want to be told. They want you to believe in them and ask them, Elaine. And it totally changed my leadership. I went back and a week later, took all our staff from the, the back end of the practice, the vet assistants, the vet techs. And I said, okay, we got a problem and I am at my wit's end how to fix it. I don't know how to fix it. And we've tried all these things. You've seen me lead all these meetings and all these strategies and none of it's working. But I think you guys know how to fix it. You guys are the ones back here enacting the plan. And I want to hear from you. What what do you think we need to do? How can we ensure we get five, you know, three elective surgeries, two non-elective surgeries, and one dental done in a morning and all get our lunch break? What's your plan? What's your ideas? I'm giving you the morning off. And I want you to just go brainstorm together. And then we'll meet, you know, in three hours we'll meet. And I want to hear what you've come up with. It was, it was a really unique way to lead a team compared to how I led them. Uh, like for them, I think they must have thought, "What, the, what's Elaine doing? She always tells us what to do. She's she's Miss Manager," and it was really powerful. They came up with some great ideas that worked. That's a coach approach to leadership instead of command and control. If if you're genuinely curious, it pushes you out of judgment. So I like using it, even in my coaching practice, you know, it's challenging to coach veterinarians because it's easy to get into fixing. And coaching is all about a meeting of equals. It's about empowering another person to take ownership of their journey and to help reflect back what you're hearing so they can gain a different perspective, so they can see their blind spots, so they can, you're helping them grow because you believe they are fully capable to enact whatever it is they want in their life. It's not counseling where they're broken and you're fixing, I shouldn't say broken, where it's not counseling where you're diagnosing and trying to fix a problem or solve a problem. It's not mentoring where there's a bit of a power differential, the person with the experience, the person without the experience. It's not consulting where you're an expert and you need to, you know how to tell people what they should do. It's truly a, a unique place where people are coming in and you see them as not broken in need of fixing that they have everything within them to build the life they want to build and you're just helping them find that I love that yeah one final question because I do think it is a lot of the heart of what we do what are you most grateful for in this moment when I think about our conversation it's different. Like I'm grateful to have met you, Megan, and to have a chance to um, share my story with the profession. And, not but, and really what I am most grateful for, and we didn't get into sort of my limiting beliefs and my challenges that I have and continue to work on with my origin story, my family of origin. And so what I am so grateful, and I'm going to try not to cry, is the relationship I have with my kids. They are so sad. Oh my gosh, this is embarrassing. So my relationship with my husband and my kids, it is real. It is messy. I'm so, so glad I got to that place and created a new, a new model for our family. This is Elaine. That's beautiful because, you know, back to what we talked about, you know, focusing on what we can control and it ultimately, what what is that most beautiful circle that we can contribute to? It is our family. It is our, our significant others. It's our closest friends. Not everybody has significant others. Not everyone has children, but it is really those, the closest relationships to us that putting forth that effort to to be the best for them is one of the most beautiful things I think that a human being can experience. 
This has been the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. Whether you are listening or watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure you are subscribed to catch all these amazing people in our profession. Also, send this episode to someone you think who would appreciate it. Have a recommendation for someone who would be a good guest? Please reach out on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. There aren't that many Dr. Sprinkles. Until next time, Vet Lifers.